agree to the first talk in this track. I'm very happy to introduce you uh, Tony Tu. He's uh, working at the Tim Group. He did C and C++ and Java, and now he uh, reads uh, JavaScript at the front end of the web. And uh, I'm very much looking forward to hear about uh, the React framework. Some of you might already know from Facebook. How, how good is it? Is it any use? Or uh, should you choose something else? I guess it's very good. Thank you. So good morning. Um, <clears throat> firstly, this is our, our first conference talk, so hopefully it doesn't uh, completely go wrong, but uh, let's see. So <clears throat> I'm working at Tim Group, and uh, we do financial web apps. Uh, and for the last two years, we've been doing a lot of client-side uh, web apps. Um, and we've used Backbone.js, and that was an experience. But recently, the last six months, we started using React. And I'm just going to talk about what we, uh, how we found it. And it has been, for me, um, quite a difference, certainly, from background. It, it's it's uh, really helped us build something quite complex. If, if, you, <coughs> if you're not familiar with React, it's a, a library for building uh, a user interface. Uh, it's working at a higher level than HTML. And it's quite nice because it's, it's got a lot of, a, quite a simple conceptual model, which has helped us build, I think, a complex application while keeping the kind of code simple. This talk, if you're already familiar with React, it's, it's actually maybe not perfect for you. I'm going to not talk about everything about React, it's, I'm trying to avoid a tutorial and more focusing on what the benefits that we found at Tim Group when we used it. So, yeah, if you're screaming your head, why isn't he talking about that? I'm oh, sorry, we can, uh, it's, it's kind of intentional. I think there's a lot of tutorials already out on the web, and if you want to learn about React, it's a much better place than in a 45 minute talk. Keeping things simple, keeping uh, it simple is the theme I, I'm going to have throughout the talk today. And by the word simple, I mean a definition, something that's easily understood or done. I think, uh, for, for me, I find a door handle very simple. It, you know, anyone can look at a door handle and they're going to know what to do with it. And they, they, they're not going to know how to use it. Uh, so there are three things about React, the three aspects, which. Uh, and kind of the, the, the architectural pattern that, they rec that people recommend uh, that makes it simple. First, the building blocks you use to build your user interface uh, is called components, and components that can com easily be composed together. Second, the second aspect is the architectural pattern that the community recommends is makes it really easy to understand how your data flows throughout your application. And you can also kind of predict, given some sort of data, how your application is going to behave. And it doesn't sound like much, but coming from what we were doing with Backbone, it's a huge, huge deal. And I'll kind of elaborate on that later in the talk. And finally, I think React takes away a lot of the complexities and concerns you have with kind of rendering to the browser in a performant way. Web applications are very complex these days. You can do a lot, and the browser, you're really pushing browsers to the limit. And having to think about all that, as well as your domain logic, as well as your business logic, it's quite a lot to take in. And certainly, your complexity in your application can balloon if you have to deal with all that. It's nicely, React kind of abstracts that away so you can be concerned with what you're trying to do with your application and your business logic. So the first aspect I talk about is composable components. And so in React, when you build your user interface, you're going to define things as components. Everything is basically a component in React. A component encapsulates the user interface elements of the application domain. And what I mean by encapsulation is, for example, at a very low level, you can have a component that's a red button. And any, anywhere that you have dangerous things in your application, like you're going to delete something, you might want to use this red button component. That's quite a low level. Above that, slightly higher, then you might have, uh, you might encapsulate, uh, let's say, a dialog box. So whenever you want confirmation for a particular action from your user, you could reuse this component. 
And that dialog box might then you might use use your lower level component, your red button there to do that. And right at the top, for your whole application, you might you'll have a component that represents your screen. So you might have a component for your settings screen, your component for your home page. And so all, all of them, like I said, are React components. You kind of just put them together, compose them. The really nice thing about React is when you compose components, it's, it's not an imperative way. You don't say new component and then insert it into this component. It's all declared, declarative here. It makes it quite easy to kind of look at your code, React component code and say, OK, I can already see what it's going to look like. A lot like HTML. The other aspect of components that are quite nice is the interface to, to work with them is quite straightforward. It's quite simple, and I'll, I'll uh, elaborate on that later. And finally, um, components don't hold state. Well, they recommend you don't have to hold state. You make stateless components. You could do it if you really want to, but it's quite actively discouraged. And once components that have state, I mean, it's somewhere else, but it just makes it a lot easier to predict what your component's going to do. So <clears throat> let's dig into what a React component would look like. So let's say we have a, a component for deleting an account. Uh, if we start by looking at the template in HTML, how could you do this in HTML? You have your div container, you have your heading, you have two buttons. Now, one of these is danger button, that's actually another React component that we'll be using within this dialog component. And then you have button, which is Standard HTML button. Now, if you want to, <coughs> this, that's the template code. If you want to look at the JavaScript code, well, with React, what you're actually going to do is you're going to take this template code and turn it into our component. It is our component. All, I, all I've done here to make this template code into a React component is wrap it in a function and return it. So, Looking at that code, you might have had two thoughts, certainly when I, I would have. First one is, what, what is this syntax here? Is, is that even JavaScript? Um, it's actually, it is JavaScript. It's the latest version of JavaScript in, uh, called ES2015. Uh, and it's quite nice. It's, if you don't know much about it, I would recommend looking into it. It's, it makes the language a lot uh, nicer to work with. Uh, there's lots of uh, freely available resources on the internet about it. Lots of good books about it. But that's not React. I'm, I'm just using it today because it makes everything fit on my slide easier. And I, 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 quite, I quite like it. So hopefully it doesn't throw off anyone too much. And the second thing is, what the hell? Why, why is my template code mixed in with my JavaScript code? Uh, it's certainly <laughs> the feeling of horror in that picture is what I had when I first looked at React. I go, what? That's, this is just not right. Uh, <coughs> I think there's good reasons for it, um, that uh, the designers of React uh, uh, had when they, when, they, when they made this op, when they chose this. So it's called JSX, uh, and it's just a HTML-like syntax for describing or, or composing the React components. And like I said the same before, it's, it's a declarative way to kind of describe how your component is put together. So the designers of React, they believe that components, uh, React components, is, is the way to separate your concerns. Uh, not separating it at templates and your JavaScript code to your display logic. Because, I mean, you think about it, templates and JavaScript code, and we should separate them out. And by separation, I mean, it's a, temp in, in the, it's a template file in a templates folder and the JavaScript code in the source folder. I mean, that's really a separation of concerns. It's, it's nothing to do, your, your, your business domain doesn't dictate that you need to have these things separately. Um, so I think the other um, aspect of having JSX or having your template mixed with your JavaScript code is, and it felt right to me, was when, when I was working in Backbone and you had the, you know, we were using Handlebar's template and we had our JavaScript code, I would always, every time I kind of change my view code, then I'd switch to my, my template code. Well, then my template code, I'd do something, okay, all right, I'm gonna switch back to my, my JavaScript code. 
And I think that was a smell. At the time, I didn't notice it. I just thought that that's the way it is. But having worked with JSX now, I think that was a smell, that that wasn't the right kind of separation. So, like I said, having done this for six months now, actually, I think it's actually had a noticeable reduction in the cognitive load when I do development now. It's just, I don't have to think, oh, okay, where, where is this template code? All right, okay, let's navigate from my hierarchy, find my template code. Or e even from my template code, go back and find my JavaScript code. I and mean, I even install tools then to help me have pot keys to do switching. But even then, you still have two files. And then you say, okay, right, I need to put them side by side. So then you rearrange all your windows so you can see your template code, and then you can see your JavaScript code, and you're kind of looking in between. I have three monitors and I'm kind of, it's all spread out. It's, at the time, it was just, okay, the way it is. I didn't think too much about it. But now, that's all in one file, it's actually quite nice. I, I just read from top to bottom, uh, and I can kind of know what's going to happen. I, I see some logic, and I say, okay, there's some data that's going in. Okay, where's this data going to show up? How's it going to show up? Okay, it's just down in the part of the JSX. But anyway, what, how did this, these two, uh, template code and JavaScript code together, it actually makes the component a lot more cohesive, I find. Because now you the code that defines the behavior of the component is with the code that's describing how it's going to look or, or render onto the screen. Still, I mean, you might still feel a bit funny about these angle brackets uh, and HTML mixing of what, what looks more like just programming language, a real programming language, let's say. Uh, but it, JSX isn't magic, and what it does is it's actually quite simple underneath. Uh, so let's have a look inside what it is. So, as I say, you have this template code, and what React or, or Battle.js would do to, to, tra to transpile or transform is actually, all it does is it turns it into JavaScript function calls. So that div element up there is just a function call to the React library's create element function. You, the first argument is a string that tells you what element it should be. And the children of them are, are just passed as the arguments, the subsequent arguments to create element. It's a, if you really don't like JSX, if you really don't like having angle brackets and all that inside your JavaScript code, you can just use the React library directly like that. And there are kind of factory functions that kind of makes it a little bit less verbose. The other um, benefit of having um, JSX, or, or not really JSX, but the template code um, mixed with your JavaScript code or in your JavaScript code is it lets you use the full power of JavaScript there. Um, a lot of template languages, if you want to do some logic, you kind of have to use the, the, the constructs that it provides you. So for example, if, if I wanted to create a list uh, of all the accounts given in this uh, account array, if I want to use handlebars.js, I have a, a each helper to do that. That's fine. You kind of you have your JavaScript code, then you, you want to use handlebars, you learn the handlebars API to find out all the helpers that lets you do that. Uh, still, it's something else you have to learn. Now, if I'm in, in uh, JSX, I just use JavaScript. So I have my accounts array, like I said, and if I want to turn it, this array of strings, to list elements, I, I, well, map is an actual uh, method I could use on the, on the accounts array. And I'm mapping all my accounts into uh, a collection of uh, li elements now. So in JSX, if you want to uh, have a JavaScript expression, just kind of wrap it in those, those curly braces. So I talked about component interface being quite straightforward earlier. And so we can just, uh, this, I'll just kind of elaborate on what the interface is, is to component. So <coughs> this delete dialog we had earlier, let's say we want to add some new feature to it now. now we, when, when, when this dialog shows up, it should also tell you what account you're about to delete. So I want to pass this information, this account name, the so the way to do it in JSX is this as sets are specified as an attribute, account name, billy bomb. This is just like 
what you do with HTML, actually. So just, they like HTML attributes. But I, when I first came around, I was like, okay, well, that makes sense. I, I know HTML. Okay, I can do this. So what the component then sees is a object it's, uh, that has this, all, all the attributes that this in this object called props. So certainly that's convention for naming that object props. And in, in that JavaScript object is all the attributes that you can just read out. It's just a plain JavaScript object. So account name, if I want to read it out and put it in my heading now, it's just props that account name. So I've just shown you how we have input into our component. What about the, the other side of it? How, does it, how do we uh, handle kind of the outputs and the respond to the user clicking on those buttons? And again, it's just more attributes in your component declaration. So in this case, I'm passing in two callback handlers. So on confirm, I want you to call my handle delete account confirmation function. And if the user clicks on cancel, then just call my ha uh, handle delete account cancellation function. And similar to the, the account name property, it's also passed, it's in your props object, and you just use it uh, when, when you need it. So in the danger button, uh, I'm going to pass down, I, I want you to, hey, in our component, I want, you, I want to call the <coughs> unconfirmed callback that was passed into me. Uh, I'm giving it a lambda expression here because I want to pass in the, uh, return the account name um, that the user said they wanted to actually uh, uh, delete, confirm if they want to delete. With uh, the cancel button, it's straightforward. I'm just passing through to the uh, button element. All right, one click, call, on cancel. <coughs> so here's the code for our React component. You might, I don't know, you might have noticed it's actually a pure function. If, if there's no side effects, it's item potent. If you call it with the same props, same inputs, it's going to give you the same outputs. It's going to give you the same React. Uh, object back. And finally, there's no staking here. It, it, it doesn't, you, uh, that's quite important when we look at the next aspect of um, what uh, we found uh, made React use, uh, really uniquely useful for us. By taking these components and composing them together, what we have now is a static website. And we're building a web application, so we're going to have to have dynamic behavior. We're going to have to respond to the user clicking on buttons and uh, navigating through the application. So how, how do we go from our neatly uh, composed components and add this dynamic behavior and respond to user interactions without our code turning into something like this? I think as there's more functionality added to it, as there's more components, and as they interact more, it quickly becomes, the, the communication between components, how does it act, balloons really quickly uh, in complexity. How this complexity can arise depends on, on your architecture for like data flow, where you could have two-way data bindings, or you could have a published subscribe system, an invented system. Uh, for myself, and in my previous project when I was working with Backbone, like my bowl of spaghetti code, code came out of trying to implement a publish a pub sub uh, architecture. So I kind of just take you through <coughs> this spaghetti that we had uh, at the start. Kind of drew this diagram, and it was actually pretty straightforward. The boxes are uh, views, the lines are lines of communication. Here are the, the messages between our components, and I, I could follow this. I mean, the whole team could follow this. You just all right, something happens here, it goes over there. Something happens there, it goes over there. Uh, but then, yeah, we add some more pictures. Okay, there's a <laughs> few more lines. Uh, a little bit harder to follow, but uh, I think I can keep it in my head. And then we added more features. And then, yeah, uh, it, uh, it got hard to follow. I, I, 
it, it wasn't clear to me now what would happen. I, I couldn't predict, given some uh, interaction, that, uh, given the way that the users click on some button, what's going to happen? Where is it going to go? Uh, and besides that, in the, in the publish subscribe pattern, we also had to take a lot of care when we wired up these, these publishers and subscribers. Because if you put, if you uh, subscribe to something before the publisher is uh, too late, then you've kind of missed it. So we had to put a lot of great care in, in designing uh, our wiring code so that you couldn't accidentally cause a bug just by swapping a few lines. Um, testing also became uh, quite convoluted, I would say. So let's say you test that object that has that receives multiple messages. So you start off your happy path. Okay, I get message A, I get message B, and I want this behavior to, uh, to occur. But then you think, what happens if I get A and I don't have B yet? What should I do? All right, I'm gonna, I'll write a test for that. Okay, what if I get B and I've got A yet? Uh, okay, I'm gonna have to write a test for that. So all these things that you have to think about, just, it, it was kind of exhausting. And then uh, what we found is that people would do something else that's similar, and they say, okay, I'll just copy this, this test. And then, oh, okay, yeah, I'll just kind of, all right, I'll do this scenario. And you, at, at the time when you write it, you say, oh, okay, it's all fine. I'm, I'm just working on this feature, I'll add it. It's when you come back to it, you go, what, what's going on here? Or, or, or why? <laughs> I can't understand the behavior of this component just by reading the test. It doesn't really describe it. You're telling me this and this happened, but why? It's just, it's, it sounded more like it's a lot of code to deal with, with edge cases. And also this architecture, when we first started with it, it kind of created a solution where I had to work on this particular object, this view, and all I have to be concerned about is what messages I'm going to receive and what messages I'm going to send out. Uh, but what we found over time, especially as we added more and more features, is I had to go, this diagram was essential to my development. You know, because I couldn't look at the code and work out what's happening. I had to go back to this diagram and say, okay, here, I have this message, I want to follow this, Follow that, and we'll follow that. Uh, that was a, a, a big smell. Um, and when we started this new project, uh, where we we're trying to rebuild the user interface of a, a typical existing product, I didn't want to do this thing. I just want to take this whole spaghetti and bring it over there. So that's why we started looking at uh, alternatives. We started looking at. Uh, I mean, React was very hot on the internet, so I thought, okay, let's see what this is all about. Um, and so far, it's, it's worked out quite nicely for us. Maybe it will become something like this in another six months. But I can talk about it then. Why well, React might have been a bad idea. You should use Angular 2 or something. Uh, so, and finally, another flaw which we didn't think of when we started this architecture is I don't know if you can see it, but these little uh, little circles near these boxes. It's kind of it's supposed to be a little picture of like a database cylinder. Because what what that was trying to indicate is actually we had spread a state. Kind of spread out through the architecture. Because you, you might have two components that listen to the same message and says, okay, I need this message A and I have some data, and I need to do something different when message B comes. Okay, what was, what was it A again? Oh, okay, I have to remember that now. So then when I get B, I know I can then use the values of B in message B, the values of message A, and I can you know, do what I need to do to limit my message. So state became spread throughout the uh, architecture, which you have duplication, and then you start thinking about, well, do they all have the same values? I mean, it's supposed to be the same data, but do they all have it at the same time? And it kind of creates this kind of uncertainty. I wasn't really comfortable with that. So, like I said, React seemed to uh, solve this problem for us. And how it does it is that the, app, the application architecture they recommend is what they call unidirectional data flow, a one-way data flow. So instead of this pub sub pattern where you have messages coming from any number of places and you're receiving any number of messages, every action, so the user clicks on a button, there's some data from your network request coming in, it's going to be processed and it will update your application state. So we just trace through how this pattern, uh, how this all works. So we have our component. Its job is say, here's some data, here's some properties. I want, uh, it should, I, I'll, I'll, I'll render it to the screen. 
So this data will come from a store uh, where the state is held. So this architecture or pattern is nothing new there. It's the store is your model, the components you view. So nothing revolutionary. But it gets interesting when, okay, the component had uh, some of the user tracks of it. So the, instead of the component then modifying the model, what happens is the component issues an action. And that action is an intention to say, something's happened now and the state of the application application to change. This action then gets processed by a processor, which will then is responsible for updating the application state. Now, these arrows in this diagram, they all kind of point in one direction. That's why they call unidirectional data. Uh, in our project, the, the library that implements unidirectional data flow is uh, called Redux. Um, and some of the names are a bit different from my previous diagram. So the store, Redux calls it as the state tree, uh, and the processor I was talking about is Redux is called the reducer. And I think the, the, the a unique aspect of Redux, uh, certainly when I first came across it, is this state tree, there's only one of them. There's only a single instance throughout the lifetime of the application, and all your state is stored in there. Now, at first, this sounds, sounds quite crazy, but actually, uh, what I found is it actually provides a lot of benefits. Uh, and uh, simply, one, one thing is, unlike my you know, top sub architecture implemented where state was everywhere, you're not quite sure where to find it. Uh, you might just do breadth through your code, so well, the string means the same thing. It's all in one place. You just look at it, this one file, and there's all your state. So if we walk through how um, data will flow through this system. So we start off with our components, and let's say we have a delete account component, and we have an account list component, okay, who just wants to list all your accounts um, on the screen. We have data in our state tree, so an array of accounts, and also we might have, like I said, other data that's uh, not related to these components, but like session login, but like, well, I'll put it there to kind of show you that all of your state is, is within this single state tree. So this information gets uh, passed or ejected into our components, our components will, will generate the, uh, the React elements to, to render that. The other thing about a state tree that contains all your data is it starts to feel a bit like like a database. Especially when Redux allows you to kind of say, for this component, I'm not just going to give it the whole state tree, I'm going to give it a, a certain part of it, because this component only cares about this part of it. So then you start writing things that feel a bit like a query. Um, and that realization to me kind of made me feel a bit better, actually. It wasn't some radical new thing, it's an idea. It's kind of been done in different contexts. So, <coughs> Let's say in the delete account component, the user has, has clicked, yep, I want to delete this account. What delete, the component, the delete account component does then is dispatches an action, and it says the action is of type delete account. And what the user wanted to delete is it puts in, uh, by convention, a payload attribute called, and it says it's Google, Google account delete. That action is it, it sent to a reducer who processes that action and then updates the state tree. When I say update, it returns a new copy, uh, a new uh, copy of the state tree, which doesn't have Google in the accounts array anymore. So then, uh, our state tree's been updated, we have, we have <coughs> the accounts array now about Google, and that, what that does then, Redux says, okay, well, I need to tell all my components about this new state. So it passes it down to components. Account list says, okay, I've got some new data on a random screen, okay, what am I rendering? I'm just rendering, in this case, the Facebook. Uh, this, like I was saying before, this isolation of state into a single state tree is, is been quite nice. Uh, and it really, for me, it really helped keep things simple. I could kind of know where my state was, I could just look at it, and I know what the, the, the um, 
the functions that we're going to manipulate or transform that state. So I talked about this reducer. The name reducer is intentional because it's, uh, it's a reducing function. It's the same kind of function you would pass to a fold or um, where you take, given some uh, inputs, give the current the previous state, here's your new action, I, want, I need to return the new state. So in this case, you kind of implement it as a switch statement. Uh, the action is delete account, and I'm gonna take the existing list of uh, array of accounts, I'm gonna filter it, and filter return me a new uh, array, which I then return. Um, and this object I assign might look a bit odd, but it's a way you can kind of create a new object copying values from the old one. Uh, and it's quite important here that we haven't mutated the previous state. Uh, and that kind of, it allows for some really cool things which I'll hopefully get enough time to talk about. Uh, <clears throat> so finally, the third aspect uh, and I talked about is rendering to the screen. And there's a cost when you want to render your components to the screen. The browser has to say, okay, given this uh, basic HTML elements, I have to work out the layout, I need to, and then I need to then put it all onto the graphics card. And there's a time it, uh, to do that. Uh, so hopefully it doesn't take too long, but even then, after you've paid the cost to have your page loaded, you don't want to kind of have to re-incur that cost every, because of changes um, in your application, because some data has been updated, you've got some new data from the network. Uh, so it's quite easy to think about, okay, I don't want to pay for that cost. I let me just change in my, uh, in my browser window or on my DOM tree just those elements that have, that have uh, been changed. So I keep everything the same, so the browser has to do everything again. But it's actually quite hard to do that. And there's a cost to maintaining code to do that. So let's take an example. We have this list, we've got two items. Uh, the user has added a new account. And they said, I want to delete this Billy Bob account. So I want to insert this new, new uh, list item in. It's sorted alphabetically. And I've got, we want to remove this other list item. So we start, OK, let's create our new list item, John Smith. Uh, I need to insert this alphabetically. So I want to insert it before uh, Mary. And then uh, I want to use the DOM method, insert before Mary. So, uh, but then that method exists on the parent node. So I'm going to get get the parent node of Mary and then I'll call insert before, find it's in there, and then finally, I'm gonna delete Billy from, from the list. So, you look at this, and this is, it's a very naive implementation of how to manipulate the DOM, and it's probably a lot better, and much more elegant and performant ways of doing that. But, as an application developer, I don't wanna think about this. You know, I, I, you know, if somebody else can do this for me, great, because, I have to do all this, as well as all my uh, application logic for my uh, business domain. It, it's a lot to, 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 uh, to take in. Um, and so the R team isn't a very big team. You can't say there's a team dedicated to writing performant rendering code, and a team that's just dedicated to doing the, uh, the application logic. So like I say, in my ideal world, what I want is, here's my application state, and I'm, I'm, I've got code that manages it uh, correctly, and, it's all valid for the business domain. And I'm just going to give it to the rendering code. And the rendering code can do whatever it needs to do to render it in a performant way on the router. So React has enabled this ideal world for me. Um, it's got a simple programming model where the, it seems like when you're using React, it's re rendering the whole application. Um, but it doesn't do that because it's still terribly slow. And how it does that is it, it abstracts away the DOM, the browser's DOM, into a, a, a virtual representation. So they call it as a virtual DOM. And anytime you're, you're, uh, you change your components or, or your components return different values, it'll change this virtual DOM that's in memory. And changes to the virtual DOM doesn't immediately give it to the browser, so the browser doesn't have to calculate all the reflows and how the whole screen will change. Um, we just quickly change this model, this virtual DOM, and then React then has a, a reconciliation cycle where it says, okay, given my, what I understand the DOM should look like, what it is now, how, how do I make it match? How do I show it to the user? So we walk through this process. So we have an application state, and we give it to our component, so the component says, render. Okay, 
What does that mean? The virtual DOM now looks like this. I've got John, it's a list item of John Smith and Mary Sue. React then goes, okay, <clears throat> what's the difference between these two? Uh, and it then it calculates a patch. So in this case, it'll say, okay, the only difference is actually the first item, instead of saying Billy Bob in the text node, it's actually John Smith. So our, my, what I need to do is just replace the text content. This is a lot more efficient than what I was doing before, where I was insert, deleting a node, inserting a node. And it, can, it deals with how to make that um, perform. So once it's reconciled everything, you have your virtual dog. Uh, look like your browser dog until next time when something else changes. So I want to finish today by talking about some of the uh, developer tools which uh, are available when, you, when, you, when you're developing in React and Redux. And I think these tools are actually made quite pleasurable for us to, to work with React. First, I'm going to demonstrate something called hot reloading. It's, um, you might have heard of live reloading, but it's different from that. Live reloading, you change your code, and your browser will, just, your browser will refresh that whole page, and you can see your changes. Hot reloading is, I think, I would say much more advanced than that. Instead of reloading your whole page, which means if you have your types of values in there, it just changes that part of the page uh, which you change in your, your code. So I'll, I'll try and show you a, a demo here. Hopefully it works. It's an animated GIF. I was too scared to do, do this live. <laughs> so <laughs> there's your state. Uh, and let's say I want to change the heading now. Uh, I'm going to call it your accounts instead of accounts. So I change it. I hit save. There it is in the browser. Uh, okay, let's say I was saying that it, it doesn't refresh the page. So I want to type into this field. Uh, and then now I'm going to say, oh, actually, oh, I want to change the style of this input. Uh, this is too cramped. I need some spacing around there. So I add some a style attribute to there. Margins. There it is. You just notice that Twitter that I've typed in is still there. It's quite nice, especially when you're playing around your apps and you say, oh, I want to try something out different. You can do it, you don't have to start again. Again, it's this cognitive load that I was talking about. It's, it's subtle, but it kind of builds up and it makes it, like I said, quite pleasurable. The next thing is a thing called Redux Logger, where all these actions in our unidirectional data flow gets logged to the console. This really helps when you're trying to trace through what, what's happening in the application um, and how the data kind of flows through it. So let's say I delete this account. Then you'll see in the console, here's the previous state. And then you see the action that um, was uh, emitted. And then you'll see the new state that after your reducer has dealt with the delete account action, you've only got one account there. So let's say I do a different kind of action. I'm going to add an account. And you see. Previous state, it didn't. It only had the, the one account in there. You have your action, add account action. You see your payload, John Smith, and then here's your new state, John Smith and uh, Mary Sue. Having all this in the console really helps with tracing what's happening with the data flow. It makes it uh, quite, I wouldn't say predictable, but it kind of reinforces how your application architecture uh, functions. Now, here's something really cool when I, uh, about Redux. Uh, when I was saying about the state, it shouldn't uh, mutate the previous state, it should always return a new copy of it. It allows some really cool things like this uh, tool called Redux Debugger does. So what the Redux Debugger is, it captures all your state. <coughs> so you've, it's a Chrome extension you can install. And you load it up, it tells you what your state is. I've deleted the count, similar to the logger, I can see the action and I can see the new state. Then, let's say I add a, an account again. And you can see now, there's the add account. Now here's a really cool thing. What if I did delete that account? So, now let's say I did delete the account. You just click that, and there it is. There's your, what it looks like now, the account was deleted. But what if I didn't add that account? Uh, I'll put that back, and let's say I want to uh, save this 
as I as I played my applications, I could commit, and then I could change some more things. Oh no, no, actually, I want it to be what it was before, so I could then uh, hit the revert button and take you back back to the previous state. Uh, when this was first presented at the <coughs> party, it was called like time traveling debug. Uh, <laughs> Right, uh, let's actually skip one of my slides. The last thing I want to talk about is um, uh, Facebook is developing a kind of uh, called the React Dev Tool. And it, it's similar to uh, the, the elements panel in your um, Chrome uh, Dev Tools, but instead of showing you a tree of HTML elements, it shows you a tree of um, all your React components and what properties is passed into that component. So thank you for your time this morning, and uh, hopefully uh, it's been uh, useful to you. And if you need to contact me, you can contact me on Twitter or by email. So we have a few minutes left for questions. Yes, please. Um, so I've been currently my junior lecturer there, so it's well, and always found a few things that are very tricky. For example, you have this um, delete button. Mm -hmm. Now, the delete action sometimes it could fail. Maybe because it was in the database and then it has already been deleted. So I would like to send the user information saying, yeah, you successfully delete or have some fancy animation that takes the account to delete and shuts it away and something explodes. Yes. So, um, so how do I how do I, do I model that? Because I, I guess I don't want to put in the state that I have a delete window open and then put into the state that the delete was successful, then put in the state that the user has seen that the delete was successful and then go ahead. Actually that's it. That's what you're supposed to do. And if I'm, I'm, I'm still feel a bit uncomfortable doing that, but I think that's the idea. You, you're, State tree represents exactly how your application is. So if the application is showing you uh, a delete dialog, then it should be represented there because you can take that state, give it to all your components, and then we'll just render that as well. So every action is an intention for the state change. It's happened. It's a fact now. It's not okay. If I do this, and then what other actions happen? Does that make sense? A little bit, but then two questions. Um, first, why <coughs> the, the input box? Why was there not one event for every? Because that's part of your state. Yeah, you, uh, you certainly could do that, and then actually in the application we wrote, we do do that. Everything in time is there's trade-offs there too, right? If you do that, then it kind of like well, a lot of events and a lot, a lot of uh, uh, processing that happens, and maybe you want to batch things up. So. It's real, once again, uh, in real life, there's always these kind of trade-offs. Okay, so there's some state you might say that's, that's fine. I'll lose that. It doesn't. It's not in my domain. It's not consequential. And you might want to capture the things that really matters. Okay, so you two will have a very interesting talk. Can I, can I follow up on that briefly? Yes. So I agree that React conflates sort of your application state and sort of uh, state in the GUI that's just an artifact of it with a GUI structure, yeah. right? Um, so and I, I argue that's a little deficiency in, in, in React that it forces you to some organization. So we did, we did a, a front end and closure script for React, which gives you exactly that distinction between the GUI state and the and the, uh, and the application state, and that's. But it's a subtle difference. And talking to the developers, they're not always sure good in which one it is, right? So, but I agree, it's it's uh, it's significant. Okay. So, that's so in this diagram you have in this loop, so to say, yes. um, these messages must be buffered somewhere, especially if the system comes under pressure. At what point is it buffered? Is it buffered at the outgoing side or at the incoming side, or are there specific? Is it transparent? Just, just well, this is it's a, it's a user interface. I mean, certainly that's not something I, a problem we've had to face yet. So mm -hmm. I can only speculate how you do it. But with a user interface, not that many things happen that quickly. You're responding to user clicking, or you're responding to some data uh, coming through. I mean, we have we're not writing any kind. Of, at code on the front end, it's doing a lot of processing and lots of messages. So, uh, as far as I know, it doesn't really do any buffering or relapse. It just kind of like it, it, it's all kind of single threaded. Something happens, it goes and processes it, then the next thing, then the next thing. And part of it makes it kind of predictable. This action happens and this action happens. I mean, once you have a network request, there's a bit of asynchronicity there too. Um, 
And that's what these the, the, the debug tools kind of helps you look at. Uh, sorry, I didn't really answer your question, but it's, it's not something I'm familiar with. I mean, yeah. if there is a timer, for example, you have a button, you have a timer, yeah. they can happen at the same time, so to say, um, and they need to get serialized. So there's yes. a communication channel, and if there's a communication channel, you need buffering unless, unless you... I think then that just then becomes the browsers. The browsers are then right. come through and it kind of queues okay. up into the browsers and then you'll do this process as mm -hmm. it pulls it off. Do you do any testing, and if so, on which level? Uh, we certainly do all levels, maybe too many levels. Unit testing for components, we have integration testing and maybe components together. Then we'll have a, a, a higher level. We we'll always have browser tests that kind of just click some buttons and say, well, they're horrible. Yeah. Okay, so um, we have a coffee break. You can um, watch the Tony, I guess, and then you can ask another question in the coffee break. So thank you very much again, Tony. Thank you. Until uh, quarter to twelve.